to describe the scene here. I was sitting in the first row when Malcolm came on the stage and greeted the audience. Several persons, it happened so quickly, I, I can't describe them, stood up and fired shots. Everybody dove for the floor. I dove myself and crawled over to the side trying to get out from the scene of the shots and uh, crawled back along the balustrade as shots rang out all over the place as Malcolm's supporters tried to subdue those who had fired upon him. He's now laying on the stage. My agent tells me that he has been shot twice and that he is still alive but feebly. I saw people crawling on the floor, and so I got down too. Then when I was looking out and I saw um, someone um, look in amazement to the front, I knew they had shot my husband. Well, could you give me your impressions? I know it's difficult for you to remember right now, but try to remember just exactly what happened. Well, he had just got up to open up, and uh, the two fellas, one was a black Muslim, and I don't know who the other one was, because I didn't see him, ran and started shooting, and everybody black fell to the floor. Yes, sir. They were black. Yes, sir. He got shot in his face and three times in the chest. I was back here. I was setting up a uh, chain of command. Uh, I didn't see anything. No. Chain of command? Yes, yeah, right. For what? Changing posts. Oh, I see. You were one of Malcolm's guards. That's right. And you didn't see what happened? No, I didn't. I heard the shots. I ran forward. Mm -hmm. I saw Malcolm hold his side and hold his stomach and fell down. How do you feel now? I want to kill somebody. That's right. I want to kill somebody. Before the night's over, if Malcolm dies, somebody's going to die. Almost immediately after the shooting, New York City police apprehended two suspects, one identified by police as 22-year-old Thomas Hagen. He was caught outside the building, was shot in the thigh by one of Malcolm's bodyguards, and then beaten by anybody who could reach him with fist or foot. Now the news. Malcolm X, militant Negro leader, is dead. The 39-year-old head of the Black Nationalist movement went down in a hail of bullets as he was about to address a group of 500 people in Harlem this afternoon. Hi, I'm Jenna Flanagan of Metro Focus. On the 96th birthday of the late Malcolm X, the Shabazz Center in Harlem is celebrating the life and legacy of the late El Haj Malik Al Shabazz, otherwise known as Malcolm X. And while the celebration will include musical performances and special guest appearances, it is also a chance to further the work of racial equity, justice, and cultural production of both Malcolm X and his late wife, Dr. Betty Shabazz. As part of our ongoing Chasing the Dream initiative on poverty, justice, and economic opportunity in America, I'm joined now by Ilyasa Shabazz, an author, co-chairperson of the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Education Center, and a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice to talk about her parents' legacy and the social justice movement today. Welcome, Professor Shabazz. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be with you guys. Absolutely. It's great to have you on. And what I wanted to start off with was, of course, this celebration of your father's uh, birthday is, I think, for especially people in Harlem are familiar, this is um, an annual event. But I'm wondering if after not only uh, the year of 2020 and, of course, the pandemic and all that that laid bare, but also the social justice, specifically Black Lives Matter movement that we saw gain so much um, support across the country, I'm wondering, where do you see uh, the civil rights movement, fit this civil rights movement that we're experiencing now, fitting into the movement that your parents helped create and get started? Well, let's see. Well, well what I would like to see done is, is uh, and, and what we're doing at the Shabazz Center is merging, the merging of successful ideas of the past and amalgamate them into some of of the more visionary plans and strategies, which are current in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, uh, we have this really great intergenerational dialogue with some of the activists of the 1950s and the 1960s with present day activists and just young people who want to learn. When my parents were active um, and when 
uh, young people were active in, in their time. Um, they made demands. Uh, and, and one of the, the most central objectives that they posed was Black liberation, which is still an elusive dream and desire on the agenda. Of course. And so from your perspective, though, um, the fact that this, unlike uh, previous uh, perhaps movements, which may have been, you know, a handful of uh, non-Black people who are participating, but mostly sort of a Black movement, that this time it seems to be um, much more multicultural and that there's so much more support for, and a better understanding of the structural racism that exists in America than perhaps that we've had before. That's right. Um, you know, what I thought was really fantastic was that it was the young people who guided this, this kind of movement. And um, we did see people, um, you know, here we are all at home, quarantining ourselves, not understanding what this COVID thing really was. was. And, you know, we were forced to watch this horrific uh, killing of George Floyd. And what was you know, uh, just absolutely amazing. I think it was because we were questioning our mortality that young people, people who were compassionate, people who recognize that black power is not exclusionary, but black power simply means that we are also a part of the human family. There were young people who drove our nation toward a more civilized space. And we saw people marching in this country in 50 states and abroad in 18 countries, we see that a synthetic identity was born and our society is moving forward. Bigotry and all its ugly hate um, is losing and a new era has yet to define itself. And I think the lesson um, that our young people are learning is that cheaters lose, moral character wins. And so I take my hat off to this young generation. And, and, and you know, we continue to have, you know, these great discussions at the Shabazz Center. Um, you know, uh, we have these, um, we, yes. Of course, of course. Um, and I think that furthering those kind of dialogues as so many people who have been active uh, in the civil rights movement of the 1960s and Black Lives Matter now, definitely emphasize the importance of open and honest and frank dialogue. So of course right. that's so important. I also wonder though, um, because the uh, Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz uh, Memorial Center is the former, formerly known as the Audubon Ballroom, the location where your father was assassinated. And just the notion, there's so much conversation right now about taking up space and reclaiming space. And that seems like a perfect example of uh, reclaiming a space that was a source of so much pain. And I'm sure specifically for your family to recreate it and rebirth it as something that's so positive and forward thinking. Um, is that something that I think uh, the rest of the country and also New York City can definitely take a page from and learn from? I think so. You know, one of the lessons that um, we learned from my mother and that we pass on to um, the young people at the Shabazz Center is, you know, listen, this place represented um, tragedy for her. And yet, you know, she went on with six babies. She got her PhD. Well, you know, she already had her undergraduate degree. She went and she got her master's degree, her PhD. Education was extremely important. Um, and, and not just any education, but a quality education, right? Where all people understand that they made significant contributions to society. Um, and she turned a place that represented tragedy into a place of triumph. And her motto was find the good and praise it. And, and that is exactly what she did. And I think, you know, when it comes to our education curriculum um, that, you know, we have to understand the omission of black, brown, indigenous people of color, Latin, Asian history is not um, accidental. These kinds of exclusions distance people from their own heritage and ultimately their own sense of self. Um, 
you know, if we learned about uh, uh, African, uh, you know, uh, let me just go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Scientists and architects have documented that Africa is the cradle of the most advanced civilization that ever existed in humankind. Hence, there are these African kingdoms full of immense progress, scholarship, and knowledge, Benin, Nigeria, Egypt, the Sudan. And if we learned about these kinds of topics, right, in world history classes, just as we learn about ancient Greece and Rome, we could better appreciate the present complexities of Black civilization without teaching racism and hate and discrimination. It provides us an opportunity to, um, to instill a value system of honesty, compassion, love, respect. And these are the kinds of ideals that, you know, that we um, discuss and implement at the Shabazz Center. It's the same kind of education curriculum that my parents made sure that my sisters and I had so that mm -hmm. we grew up understanding how important self-love is. If you teach hate, you, you teach our, if we're teaching our children to hate others or to discriminate, then we're teaching them how to hate themselves. If we teach our young people how to love themselves first and foremost, then we see one another as a reflection, right? I see you as a reflection of me. I love me. I love you. And when there's injustice, we chip in. And, and that is what we do at the Shabbat Center. Of course. Although I would like to ask, because one of the, I think, important things that uh, especially this current civil rights movement has taught us is the importance of perhaps re-examining history as we under or thought we understood it and perhaps giving it a second look. And with that, I do want to ask, because I understand there are calls for a second look into what exactly it was that happened to your father. And I believe that was spurred on by someone's admission at the end of their life. That's right. Um, listen, we want to know if someone has information and <laughs> you know, we want the case open, we want the uh, Manhattan District Attorney to open the case and find out who was involved in killing our father. Of course, of course. Well, I do want to uh, end this on a positive note. And that, of course, is the celebration of his birthday. And why is it so important to continue to celebrate, uh, you know, the day of his birth, May 19th, and to uh, what are the celebrations that entail with this? Well, you know, there are many um, uh, actors, uh, 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 musicians, performers who tell us, who share with us what Malcolm means to them. We have wonderful performances. Um, it's just a really wonderful time uh, to celebrate Malcolm, to be entertained and, and to be equally um, uh, engaged and informed. Uh, the legacy of my father continues to guide generations because Malcolm spoke truth and we know that truth is timeless. Uh, he was an exemplar of morality and unwavering in his commitment to bring about the human rights of all people. And, and so we just, you know, have an opportunity to celebrate him. He was just a young man when, when he um, said he was, yeah, he was, you know, yeah. Um, no, of course, he was an incredibly young man, uh, especially when he was snatched from you. I understand you were just a baby, really, when that happened. Well, that's right. And, you know, what is important for the young people is to understand that young people were marching, protesting, and demonstrating in the 1950s and 60s for quality uh, uh, lifestyle, for self-respect, right, mm -hmm. for quality education, quality health care. And Malcolm came along and said, we demand our human rights as your brother. We demand our human rights ordained by God. And he introduced a human rights agenda for the first time to the civil rights movement. And it was to ensure that people, um, human rights were not violated, not only in this country, but all across the world. And so 
you know, ordinarily we are at the Shabazz Center and people come from all around the world and they sit in our audience and they are entertained and, 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 and educated and it's just a wonderful experience. And the past two years, we've had the opportunity to have this virtual program, which means that, um, you know, more people get to watch. And, and so I just, you know, welcome everyone to tune in and, and just learn and feel the love and, and have a wonderful time with us. Absolutely. And of course, the virtual experience is the experience that we're all still having right now. That's right. That's right. Um, Professor Shabazz, Ilyasa Shabazz, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time to not only talk about this uh, incredible and important celebration of your father's birthday, but also the ongoing work that's being done at the Shabazz Center and of course how that relates to our moment now. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread. Amplified.